morning, The Way. It's good to worship with you. It's good to be with you. When I went to get my glasses, they were like, oh, what do you do for a living? And I go, oh, I'm a pastor. And they go, oh, you're going to need these kinds of glasses so that you can look at your sermon notes and see your congregation at the same time when you're preaching. So I'm going to just, yes, <laughs> yes, I see you. I see you, and you're beautiful. These glasses are working. I'm reading my words, and there's your beautiful faces. Technology. I don't know if glasses are technology, but amen. Uh, I'm so glad to be, I guess we're just in, what, the second or third week of January of 2019. Um, I realize some of y'all don't know who my husband is, and he doesn't frequently grace 9 a.m. with his presence. But uh, wave your hand. That, that's my husband back there. That's my husband, Cameron Hackett. That's my best friend. I really like him. Um, 11 years. All right. So, <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's his pajama. <laughs> we're, uh, as Pastor Mike said, we're a week into our season of consecration, and uh, I get teased because I don't come from this holiness tradition, and I was like, is it just me? Like, whole church fasting is, is relatively new for me. I took a whole Facebook survey. Like, I was like, who else? Like, who in your church? And I was like, oh. Black churches fast and see God. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I grew up in too many white Presbyterian churches. Mm, I didn't get formed. So um, I, it was really, I had a friend, actually, she's a, she's a Lutheran, a Lutheran uh, priest. And she's like, well, you know, I was curious about your question. So I posted it to our, like, clergy board. And she's, there's, like, thousands of clergy in there. And it's a really active Facebook group. So I was like, hey, do any of you guys do, like, church-wide fasting? And she goes, it was crickets for, like, four hours. And then someone goes, as in food? <laughs> so I was like, okay, okay, we're all on a spectrum. Um, turns out, too, though, that if you come from like a Pentecostal or like charismatic tradition, then also there's going to be more fasting. So I've really been learning a lot. The devotional has us talking about prayer, H-S-P-E, humble, specific, persistent, expectant prayer. So last week we were talking about humble prayer, and now we're talking about specific prayer. It's really good, and it's really short, and so it's just worth getting on there. Sometimes I'm like, I have a high, like, I don't like cheesy, uh, Christian cheesy things bother me. Like, I have a very high, like, that kind of factor, like, mm. And so I came in, and I was like, we're going to do it because we're doing it as a church. But as I've been going through it, like, inside my, like, cynical little heart's been like, it's good. It's helping me. So uh, if, if any of you are like that inside, I just want to let you know, it's really, it's helping me. So I'm appreciating. So I know I'm just being too honest out here. I should just be like, mm, fasting so easy for me. I pray 24 hours a day. But I try to keep it real just in case any of y'all out there are still on the journey. You know? <laughs> Pastor Mike, Pastor Tanisha, they keep it on the saved end of the spectrum. And then I'm like, and for those of us on the journey, I represent for us. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> as uh, Pastor Mike announced last week, our uh, vision for the year is um, igniting. Igniting, And we're talking about igniting gifts and igniting growth. And we're going to be in uh, the scripture that's anchoring that is 1 Corinthians 3. And so we're just going to be looking at that scripture a little bit today, getting some context, and we'll just come back and revisit that scripture repeatedly over the course of the year. So um, let me, let's get uh, some background. Let's read the actual core scripture first, which is 1 Corinthians 3, which is what Pastor Tanisha opened us up with. So it says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Now, I just want you to think about this. Paul planted this church, and he's like their pastor and a mentor to them. So imagine your mentor writing a letter to you that opens with, I fed you with milk, not solid food, because you weren't ready for solid food. That's not like a compliment about their maturity. Even now, you're still not ready, for you're still of the flesh. Oh, okay. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who 
gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose. And each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So um, the context, let's talk a little bit about this church in Corinth, right? So Paul, um, he's cruising around uh, Greece, and he's uh, ministering in different parts of Greece. And he leaves Athens, and he comes to Corinth. um, And we learn about this in the book of Acts. And he meets this guy named Aquila. And Aquila is a Jewish person who had been living in Rome, but the Jews in Rome came under persecution and had to flee. Basically, the leader there was like, I'm kicking all the Jews out, right? So they're experiencing persecution um, and threats of violence from an unjust government that's causing them to flee to another country. Does that scenario sound familiar at all? All right, people who are forced to flee somewhere else Right, so they've had to flee Rome, and now they've landed in Corinth. They meet, they're, both, they're Jewish, but they're all kind of displaced Jews, and um, they are tent makers, right? They, literally, they make tents for a living, and that's also what Paul does. And that's where we get that phrase where, like, missionaries who work and are also missionaries when we call them tent makers. It comes from the fact that, like, Paul was a tent maker and Priscilla and Aquila were tent makers, meaning they made their own living while they were also planting churches and doing ministry. And so they um, start the church, Paul's ministering there, Priscilla and Aquila, they are helping with that. And then um, basically he starts by talking to the Jews and then they get really antagonistic towards him. And he's like, he's basically, he's like, I'm done with you. I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna go talk to the Gentiles. Like I'm tired of Jews. And God gives him a really specific, specific word that says like, basically don't, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent for I'm with you. And no one's going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. That's the word that God gives to Paul. And so Paul's like, okay, I'm going to stay. I'm going to keep ministering here. And uh, the church grows and flourishes. And he stays for a year and a half, which for Paul's like a pretty decent amount of time. You build like real relationship there. And then it's, they go on a tr- they continue on a trip. They decide to leave um, Corinth. And as they go, Aquila and Priscilla, um, Priscilla and Aquila go with Paul. And I just want to make one comment about, about this. Uh, and not everyone agrees with this interpretation, but ha, ha, I'm preaching. So you're going to get my interpretation, <laughs> um, the interpretation I agree with. So, <laughs> so uh, to me, it's important to, to talk about the fact that this church was planted, that a woman was part of planting this church. Because even today in 2019, church planting and pastoring is still talked about as primarily the the work of men, right? And uh, one of the ways we know that she was a really significant part of this church is when we first hear about them, it's Aquila, the husband, gets named first, and then Priscilla. But as they cruise along uh, and continue to minister, it becomes Priscilla and then Aquila. The wife's name comes first. Now, you might think, like, that's not a big deal. Like, order of the name isn't a big deal. But um, if you look... in, if you look in the book of Acts, it tells us who is kind of like the main point person at any given point. So if you go through Acts and you look, when, when uh, Saul converts, uh, they, send a men- they send like a grown godly man named Barnabas out to mentor him. All right. So because Saul needs some mentoring from it's, it takes a few years to go from total persecutor and murderer of people in the church to like missionary to the Gentiles. So they were like, why don't we send somebody out to help form this man on the way? Let's not let all that fire go unformed. So Barnabas goes and for multiple years of the journey, it's always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas got sent out, Barnabas and Saul. And he's, and Saul is like his Hebrew name and Paul is his name in like the, in, in Latin and in, in the, under like the Roman context. So they're the same name. But he gets called Saul for many years, right? And it's always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, until there's this moment when they have this experience of the Holy Spirit and the center of Acts changes from being a lot about what's going on in Jerusalem with Peter, and it shifts to what Paul is doing. And when, it, when he becomes kind of the focus of Acts and the work that's happening among the Gentiles becomes the focus, they start calling him Paul, and it becomes Paul and Barnabas. So that's when we know that Paul is like take, becoming... He has kind of his mentor has like raised him up and now he's like the primary leader. The reason I just want to say this is because as we're heading into 
2019 and we are igniting gifts and we are igniting growth, in our imaginations, we always need to hold that we're igniting all the gifts in all the people. We are igniting all the gifts. And so when I look out at this crew here at The Way, and we're talking about we want to see the way go everywhere. I don't want just like brothers who are thinking about going to seminary. I want every woman and man, and I want every boy and girl to go, that call could be on my life. That invitation could be for me. I could start a church. Like in my growing up, literally, like I, I'm a pastor now, but I remember I was in ministry for years before I ever thought I could be a pastor because I had just never seen a woman pastor before. And when we don't see it, it's hard to envision ourselves in it, right? And when we don't see women out there being like, I could plant a church, then it's hard for us to imagine that God would use us in that way. But I want to say that all the way back in the day when the church was starting, God was using women to do this kind of work, and that's what I want to see him igniting among us. Amen? Amen? So I, that's exciting to me to know that this church that we're talking about in Corinth was started by Aquila, Priscilla, Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul, and that, that um, Paul had no problem partnering with a woman in this way. I say that, too, because Paul got used against me a lot of times as I was a young woman in ministry. The other thing I want to say is, it is noticeable to me that this church is planted by people who are essentially immigrants. People who were fleeing violence, came to a new place, and God used them to start a church there. Because right now, there is a crisis at the border. There's not, it's not a crisis that, um, not the crisis that Trump is trying to pretend is happening at the border. The actual crisis at the border that he is creating is of children being separated from their parents not being supervised, not being with family, uh, being looked after by adults that aren't always qualified and frankly are taking advantage of their vulnerability sometimes and are being ongoingly dehumanized. But when we think, when we imagine into 2019, when I think about, it's not that I just wanna see those kids taken out of detention. Right? It's not that I just want to see them reunited with their families, but I believe that God could bring renewal to our church here through them, yes. that we yes. need them. Yes. Right? So it's not just about, oh, I hope they get out of crisis and survive, but just like Aquila and Priscilla, not, it was about more than just surviving in a new place. God used them to be a part of his work there. And so I just want to say, a lot of times we don't always welcome the influence and work of immigrants in this country, right? I mean, in all honesty, I think we know like there can be like a little bit of like cultural elitism among people from the United States. But I think we need the influence of believers from other parts of the world to come in and disciple us. So can we say yes to that? Can we say yes to that? So I just love what the church in Corinth models for us, because we need what it's talking about. We need women church planners like Priscilla. We need immigrants like Priscilla and Aquila who are fleeing danger, um, but establish their lives and are used by God in their new location. So I love that. So this is beautiful church plant, and it's growing, and Paul spent a long time with them, and then he's writing this letter, and he, lit he jumps right into it. We're at our core verse for the year is in chapter 3, but if you look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he does the thing that he does, which is basically like, hello, church in Corinth, we all love Jesus, we all trust God, so... I mean, he jumps into it really fast. If you look in some of his other letters, he'll go on for a long time about just, you know, people he wants to greet and good things that are happening. He doesn't spend any time being like, mm, I heard so many good things about y'all. He's like, hello, you remember me. What is wrong with you? <laughs> right? And right from chapter one, it's like verse five of chapter one. He goes, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? So the thing he says in it, uh, three chapters later, he says right out the gates. So let's just talk about what is going on here. There's all this competition, all this competition. Oh, I think I'm fancy because I'm taught by Apollos. Oh, Apollos? Oh. Well, Pastor Megan Brad, my pastor. Oh. Oh, really? Because I grew up Kojic. Oh, you did? Because, I mean, that's fine because because I am Baptist. <laughs> Oh, well, that's cute. That's nice for you. Um, 
you know, I don't know. We, there's, there's all this competitiveness. You know, it can be about your denominational background. It can be about, you know, your educational background. It can be about, uh, I think for the younger generation, it can be about what's going on online. Oh, yeah. You know, just like, no big deal, but it's like my Instagram post did get a lot of likes in the first 12 hours. <laughs> you know, it's not a big deal. My Facebook Live video is just so interesting how many people watched it, <laughs> right? There's all these ways that we are competitive with each other. Anybody out there know what I'm talking about, okay. right? And he is like, that's baby food stuff. As long as you're wasting your energy, just being competitive with each other and full of comparison, I'm gonna have to keep feeding y'all this Gerber. I wanted to, right, can you imagine how patronizing that is to like, if y'all came over to my house and I was like, sorry, here's some Gerber, cause you can't eat adult food, sister Sheila. It's insulting stuff. So we have to hear, he's trying to like shake him up. He's not, you know, this is not like, oh, is that a special newfangled diet? He's like, no, y'all people on baby food with your immaturity and your comparison. And I think even when we're comparing, we compare. Because we see somebody over here being competitive about something and we're like, oh, that's so basic. Because it's not what we struggle with being competitive about. But then we don't, you know, call ourselves a task on the stuff that we are competitive about, right? And all of that is just immaturity. All that is immature because our egos are delicate, little sensitive things and we'll do anything to feel validated. Right, so just all this comparison and all, whatever way you do it, well, you need to take responsibility for and realize that stuff is keeping you in the baby food land. So he goes, you think you're fancy? Mm -mm 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 -mm. You're baby food Christians. I can't even feed you solid stuff because you're so petty. So he goes, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So he's using like an agricultural image, all right? Like now I know that we're not like a group of farmers, all right? Unless there's like the secret life of the way. We're not like a big agricultural people. <laughs> but I just, he's trying to use this to change their paradigm, right? He's like, I planted something, right? When I started this church and then Apollos, who's this other like charismatic leader who came along later, he watered it, he helped you grow. He goes, you're trying to make us in competition with each other. We have a common purpose. We're not in competition. We have a common purpose. You're the common purpose. You're the field. We're trying to grow something out here. And you think we're in competition with each other? What kind of farmer is like, ooh, somebody planted a seed. I'm going to get him by watering that seed. I showed that farmer. You know, that's one purpose. You're trying to grow something in that field. So in this image, the church is the field, right? And God's trying to grow something there. So I got some, uh, a little, I, I'm not like, like I say, not very gardeny or very, um, you know, agricultural, but I had a, a recently an opportunity to um, learn a little bit about growth. So um, I was gifted with a bulb. Okay, so I was gifted with a bulb. And I took it home, and because I'm not fancy, I didn't even put it in the ground. I just threw it in a vase with some water. And I was like, ta-da. And if, go back one. Will you, will you go back one photo for me? Pew. Pew. Let's go back one. There it is. Okay. I put it in water, and it grew. It grew. And it smelled beautiful. These are called paper whites, I think. And they just, when you, even from like multiple feet away, they just give off this beautiful fragrance. So you're like, oh, that grew, that's so nice. But if you come in closer, so now we can go to the next one. If you come in a little bit closer, you can see that I actually have two bulbs. And I brought in the real thing so y'all could see. So this little guy that I was gifted went in two directions. There's this one, grew a little. Right? Grew a little, but then stopped. And then this one, which grew a lot. Notice the difference between the two. What's the difference between this one and this one? Roots. Roots. This one grew a little, but it never put anything down into the water 
to resource it to grow. And so its growth was stunted. So I want to just talk about in this image of growth, God wants to grow. God wants to grow us. God sends people along to plant and people along to water. But when we think about growth, we often think over here, right? We're like, mm, we want something pretty on the outside. But if there's no roots, there's no growth. And that's why we're taking time for consecration. Consecration is any kind of season of a clearing the way. Any kind of taking things that we that distract us and fill us and satisfy us that aren't God are saying in a hidden place, I'm not just preoccupied with trying to look cute out here, but I'm trying to make give room for God. God, grow the roots. Grow the roots. Grow the roots. Grow the roots. Because if there's no roots, there's no other growth. And so I just want to talk a little bit about how do we do this? How do we seek out roots? Um, so practices like fasting from food and Sabbath and reflection and silence and times of personal prayer or old school things. Okay, the older generation, sometimes I think we can be like, oh, older generation, like church is really boring. But they were doing some things to put down roots, uh -huh. like memorizing the Bible, yeah. right? I mean, I, I feel, and when a hard time came, they had like something to reach out to because they had the Bible in them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, sometimes, I, I don't know if you ever feel this, but I'll talk like coming, my mom being an immigrant, my aunt being an immigrant, I have so many opportunities that my mom didn't have. I don't know if y'all feel that, like you have more opportunities than your parents had. So sometimes when I'm like, ooh, I'm gonna go have like a prayer retreat, I'm like, that's so bougie, that's so extra fancy, like people didn't always, but I think the way I think about it is, I wanna learn from what my mom and my aunt's generation went through, and I also wanna receive the gifts that they made room for me to have, and also like I hope I can bring some of that back to my mom, to my aunt, to that generation who doesn't even know those resources are out there. Um, my aunt, she, she, was, she was really like the faith foundation of our family. And the thing I noticed about her was she, um, she worked as a maid for many years and a housekeeper and she had three boys, meaning that woman was busy from like 5 a.m. till 10 o'clock at night, like every day of her life. But I remember watching her in the kitchen, and I don't think I understood the depth of it, but she was always singing a hymn, and she was always praying, even when she was doing other stuff. Because she didn't have time to take a day off to do a prayer retreat, but even in the midst of other stuff, she was putting down roots. And if you're fancy and you go to seminary and stuff, you'll learn about Brother Lawrence, who, did this, who, who called that practicing the presence. Right, which was basically like, oh, you can experience God through these like formalized things like going to church or going to mass or through going to seminary. But the, the deepest and most profound way we experience God is to practice the presence of God in everything we're doing yeah. at all times. And I think that the older generation has a lot to teach us in that. Yeah. I don't think we have a lot of room to practice the presence because, and I'm not saying this as a hater, I'm saying this as somebody who deeply loves her phone and Netflix might be my best friend. I practice the presence of technology far more than I practice the presence of God. When I have any kind of spare moment, what does my eyes turn to? My phone. We can't cultivate practicing the presence of an invisible God if there is never any blank space in our hearts and minds. So that's roots. And I say that with humility, right? You know, because I love background noise. I like having a show on and the you know, and but if I think about why, why do I always like to have the noise on? Because sometimes when the noise stops, I start to think thoughts and feel feelings. And it's often they're full of anxiety. Or often it's unprocessed pain. I don't want to feel that. I want to eat cheese and watch Netflix, <laughs> right? Numb it out. Seasons of fasting and consecration are where we don't numb it out 
but we create empty space and we hold the tension saying, I turn to these things all the time to feed me, but I, I believe you could be the one to nourish me here. But it's not instantaneous. The invisible God does not just be like, great, I, I'm like, I will show up like Uber Eats. It's not that instantaneous. And so we get impatient. So we're like, I waited 30 seconds. You didn't come through. It's time to check Facebook. There is a mystery to it. The invisible God requires tension and time to let the root grow. And we, we need to help each other cultivate that. And I honestly think technology is we need to find seasons of fat, regular rhythms of fasting from technology. Uh -uh. Yeah. So I used to run this six week program where students would live um, in under resourced community. They would live uh, and they would like volunteer at nonprofits or churches for like, you know, as if it were their job for like 40 hours a week. And they would live in teams of three to five. And they would be put on a stipend that would put them on the same budget as their neighbors. So basically they got like $20 a week to cover all their food and accessories and stuff. And they gave up their phones and the internet for the whole summer. All six weeks, no phones, no internet. Now, at the beginning, everybody be full of anxiety, right? You know, there was a lot of like, <laughs> um, but like my mom needs to get in touch with me. And I was like, really, that's the main way your phone gets used? <laughs> But I'm like, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's so much anxiety. But by the end, there is relief. There's, a, it's, there's relief. And they actually feel anxious about getting their phones back because of the constant disruption. And so they actually look for ways to give themselves space from technology. So, and because the other thing is they realize that they aren't present to each other. So they... They, they learn how to be in the same room and really pay attention to each other, but they realize when they always have their phones, they might be in the same room, but everyone's looking at their phone yeah. at the same time, right? And that there's a different kind of relationship and community that gets built when we're not distracted. Yeah. One of the greatest gifts we give each other is being fully present to one another. Yeah. And so a lot of them, what they do when they go back to college is they create little boxes outside the door of their dorm rooms or right by the door where they ask people to drop off their phones when they come in the room. That's how they cultivate it. Oh. Or they pick one 24-hour period of every week that is phone off time to clear space for roots to grow, to get nourished. And the thing we have to believe is that if we clear that space, we'll get nourished. We'll get nourished in a different way than technology nourishes us, but we will get nourished. But we have to let that tension happen. For, for me, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm honest about the fact that like food fasting is new for me, but I've fasted from other things. And a, a little while back, I, took, I decided I wasn't going to buy new clothes for a year. And uh, you know, just, in just kind of commitment to simple living and money and, oh, no, I was trying to listen to Jesus. And like the first three months or whatever, I was like, no problem. I'm not even materialistic. I don't even know why I thought this would be hard, right? <laughs> and then, but you're not hungry right away when you stop eating, right? So six months in, I was like, mm, now we're in like another season. There's like cute things this season. <laughs> but it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. But like nine months in, we were like multiple seasons in, and I was like, mm, I wore this last year. Now, was I at any point uh, cold or unclothed? No, I was always clothed, always had enough to keep the rain, right? I was functionally fine. So all my angst about this clothing has to do with other desires, right? I'm not struggling the way our houseless brothers and sisters are struggling when this rain's happening. So I was like, what am I, what is clothes feeding in me? But I couldn't really pay attention to that until I stopped consuming that, right? So I was like, what am I so hungry for? And I was like, well, one, I feel like I deserve it. And I was like, okay, let's unpack that a little bit. It's like it feels like a reward. And I was like, okay, okay. Well, that's not bad. It's not bad intrinsically. But I was like, a reward for what? 
I think this is one thing. When you are trying to follow Jesus, there's a lot of things that are not ways you can reward yourself, right? Like, you're not like, I'm not like, I don't know, getting drunk, doing drugs, going to the club, whatever people do to reward themselves, blah, blah. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways we reward ourselves, but when you're like trying to follow Jesus, you're like, okay, I'm not trying to do that stuff. So then there's a few things that are like acceptable rewards for Jesus followers and food and fashion fall in that parameters. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, um, food, fashion, technology. So, um, I just, just anybody. And so I was like, I feel like this is a reward. And so then I felt as the hunger grew, then the Lord was like, but, but why can I not be your reward? And I was like, because you're not cute like this year's fashion. <laughs> and I had to press in and I had to stay in the tension. Okay, stay in the tension, right? If the fast had ended then, I would have been like, hmm, I don't know. It's a mystery. Let's go buy something. But I stayed in the tension and I was like, you don't feel like a reward. Nobody can see you. It's not immediate. And, and God was like, you need to discover how to experience me as a reward. I can be experienced as a reward, but you've never taken time to seek me and know me in that way because you didn't clear out the space. And in doing that, roots. And in doing that, more water came through. And I experienced more of God. And it wasn't instantaneous, but in staying in the tension. So as we're talking about growing this year, as we're in consecration, I just want to tease apart the process a little bit of what we're seeking God to do. Okay, I was like, that, our clock is broken. All right. I was like, I've only been preaching for two minutes. It's, it's amazing. Time stood still. Prayer of a pastor. Um, The other thing that roots do, though, and if I had not been a lazy person and put this in dirt, you would know, but roots also hold you in place when difficult things come along, right? Roots are what is in the dirt. Like, I, I have some bulbs, you know, in my backyard, and you know when it rains, even just like, rain is good, you need rain, but rain is a little bit like assaulting, right? And if my little plants didn't have roots, they would just be washed away. Even when a good thing like rain was coming, with no roots, they couldn't receive it because it would wash them away. So roots are not only how we get more water so we can grow and experience more life, but roots are also how we stay put when difficult things come that want to knock us away. And so, but here's the thing. You can't grow the roots when the storm is happening. You have to grow roots in the off season. Right? We all been there. Whereas like crisis happens and you suddenly find a prayer life, you'd be like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And it'd be like, I ain't prayed for a hot minute, but I'm desperate right now because my family is a hot mess. <laughs> and I get it, the Lord's really gracious and he's not like, hmm, who are you? I haven't heard from you for a while. He's not like that, he's not petty. But real roots are things that you have to make space to grow when crisis isn't happening. Because crisis is when you use the roots to hold you in place, right? So as we're in this season, you might be like, oh, I don't feel desperate for consecration. Good, do the work now. Let God grow it. Feel the tension when you actually have like emotional room in your life to like sit with your journal and figure, like excavate yourself a little bit and let the roots grow because testing times will come. But now is the time. Now, some of you are going through the difficult time right now. I get that. Right? And so you're going to, I can see you lean into the roots that God's given you to help you keep trusting him, to keep getting nourished. But some of us were like, it's actually the most dangerous times are kind of when there's no crisis because we get like just a little bit complacent. Right? I noticed this when, um, I have injuries right now, but I, I like, uh, training for like races and stuff, right? And the thing that'll happen is you'll train for a race and you have a goal, and then the weird time when you let it all go is right after the race, when you don't have your next goal, right? It's kind of like when there's no frame to your growth, you kind of let it go the most. And so we, as we're in this consecration season, it creates a frame for our growth. 
We're clearing out space. We're staying in the tension. If in this season, if you haven't started, it's not too late. Join us in this consecration season. It, it might be food. It might be Facebook. Whatever you need to. And then when you feel the tension, don't numb yourself out or look away. Stay in it. And just ask the questions so that you can get to where God wants to actually grow you so that the roots can go deeper. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's, um, those, are the, that, those are some of the things that God was giving me that I was so grateful to this little plant for teaching me, right? Because when you look, which plant you want to be, fam? Huh? be this plant and from even when I took the picture the picture that I had up there the roots have grown this plant keeps going this plant I'm praying for so <laughs> it's been right in the struggle with us <laughs> so uh, I think I'm going to leave us there I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave us there and, and I want to just give us some time to pray and to seek God and I think all of us probably just need to repent of numbing ourselves and escaping and not paying attention to the deeper things. We'd all love this. Oh, this is my last word. This is my last word. I had a friend who was into gardening, and she used to say this thing where she was like, she was like, Christian ministries are like, it's like gardeners that love miracle grow. You want to really grow fast on the outside. And she's like, and miracle grow works in the short run. It's like stuff you put on, and the, and the roots don't grow, but the stuff out here grows. So the problem with miracle grow is the infrastructure is so weak when the fruit comes, the plant falls over because it hasn't done the slow growing work to sustain fruit over the long haul. So we don't want to be like quick fix, quick growth, quick external kind of folk. But there is something mysterious to the growth process that God wants to do. And I want us to be folks who are as interested in the hidden side of growth as we are in the external side of growth. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, yes, God. Jesus, I'm so eager for this work in us. You know, it's not instantaneous. It's not instant self-help, growing deep roots. But it's healthy, and it's beautiful, and it's vibrant. And it grows something that can last. So I pray for us as individuals, and I pray for us as a church, that you would be making us a church with deep roots, so that as we grow, continue to grow, it's something that will last. We're seeking you, God, in this season, and we just say more of you, God, more of your spirit, more of your truth, more of your transformation, more of your conviction. We welcome it. We welcome it. Don't let us be stunted in our growth, God. Don't let us be stunted in our growth. We just pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.